We are getting kicked off with our first session. One of our featured guests, who I know everyone's very excited to meet, is Stephanie Iskander. Steph <laughs> Stephanie worked on the original John Toy Line. So you are John Royalty, Stephanie. Yes. Yes, you are. So um, just to repeat from last night, if you have questions with anything, please come see me. Otherwise, we've got about an hour blocked off for your session. If we go a little over, that's fine. Um, we're right on time. And I will hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you. The gem development is quite different than the cartoon series and everything that happened, and in many ways unrelated. And I was telling someone last night that I don't think I've ever actually seen the animated cartoon. So oh, it was not a requirement of our job <laughs> to watch it. And I might, you know, I might have seen one or two kind of in passing, but uh, you know they. We had developed things so much sooner than the cartoons came out that um, it was almost uh, unrelated to us in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm going to start by telling you just a little bit about myself. Um, I, as I was introduced, my name is Stephanie Askander. Um, I have been uh, married for 40 years to my husband, Bruce. We have four children. So I was... Um, I already had young children when I became a designer, which was also unusual because nobody else in my group um, had children. And so as a parent, I looked at toys a little bit different than the single. And it was it, in our group, in the dolls group, it was all women. Although in the girls group, we called it girls toys. And all you guys know that they weren't just for girls. Um, but we were all we were all female in our uh, girl in our dolls group, but in the girls group there were guys and gals, so we had a nice mixed group. But again, I was the only mom in our group. So uh, I have six grandchildren, Aww. and they live in various places in the country. I grew up in Southern California, and I uh, received my degree in illustration. And so I started my career as an advertising and children's illustrator and worked for an ad agency for, and, and worked in the advertising business for 10 years before I discovered toys. So I was a little bit older as a beginning designer and I started my career at Mattel and um, was a, a designer in the, what they call the large and small doll group there. I was not a Barbie designer, had never any desire to be a Barbie designer. <laughs> but I was only at Mattel for a year and then I was whisked away by Hasbro and arrived at um, the Hasbro campus in February of 1986, right after 1986 Toy Fair. So here's a, here's a picture of Hasbro. Sorry, these are actually Google Maps. So. <laughs> I don't have anybody. You know, back in the 80s, we didn't take a lot of pictures. It's not like we had smartphones and we were clicking pictures all the time. So I, I do have a few pictures to share that, that were taken you know, back in the day. But um, this is basically what Hasbro looked like when I arrived. It hasn't really changed much. The top build, or the building on the top was actually where, that was the headquarters building when I arrived in 1986. And it, it was a school, an elementary school that had been converted into Hasbro's um, headquarters. And then the building on the bottom, 
was an old factory or some old building that was next door that was also used for Hasbro building, I mean for Hasbro offices, but my office, the designer's offices, were in the little short building at the top. So when I arrived at Hasbro, Toy Fair had just ended and there was a real excitement because Jim had just been produced. So just so you know, I was not involved with Jim the first year at all. So if you have any questions about Jim the first year, I probably can't answer them. Maybe a, a few that I might just know something, but generally speaking, I came in in the second, in the beginning of the second year. So um, when I first arrived at Hasbro, we had, uh, we designers, meaning all of the designers, that included G.I. Joe and, you know, all of their, I don't think Transformers was a group quite yet, or they were just starting out, but the G.I. Joe and the um, play school designers, we were all together. And then eventually, as that year progressed, 1986 progressed, they started splitting us off, and so the, the girls group, moved down into the basement and it was just dark and dreary and if you can believe it we had one telephone that was on a wall on one of the cubicles we didn't even have phones in our offices let alone computers so you know we, we had a, a kind of a communal phone and I remember getting a phone call from my husband because one of my kids was sick and having to go stand out in the hallway to talk to him about you know whatever was going on and my boss who was also childless you know, just saying, oh, Stephanie, you're just always so involved with your children. But, you know, I think in the, in the end, you're going to be a better designer. <laughs> so, in the girls' group, I'll tell you how we were structured, just so you have an idea. We had one senior director, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you their first names. And only because I'm being recorded, and I have no idea how involved these people want to be with people contacting them. So I, if you know who they are, fine. But I'm just going to give you their first names. So we had a senior director whose name was Mo. Maureen was a woman. So Mo was our big boss. And then we had, there were three groups in the girls group. There was the dolls group, and our boss was Roseanne. And there was the pony group, and their boss was Joe. Joe was a girl. And then there was the third group, which we kind of was kind of the play sets group, and, and the director of that group was Bob, and they did kind of everything else. So like get in shape girl and play sets and things. They did the play sets. Pony group was pretty explanatory. We did the dolls. So um, that's how and we considered ourselves kind of the cream of the crop as far as the the designers and the dolls group was I think fairly prestigious to be in the dolls group because you had to know how to do a lot of things. You had to know how to do fashion, you had to know how to do faces and sculpture input and you know character development and all these things. So we, we kind of felt really special. It was a really nice position to be in. But there were very few of us. As I recall in the dolls group there were only four of us and that included Roseanne who was our boss. So there was me and Kathy and Gina, and so there were three designers. And um, Gina did not do anything with Jim from when she may have worked on the play sets because she did do some play set design, but I don't remember that Gina. So it was me and Kathy and Roseanne that were the Jim doll designers. And I'll tell you a little bit about how um, something else was structured, and that's what we called the plush group, or the soft goods group. They, when I arrived, they were in the building on the bottom. So that meant that the, the fashions and the people who did the sewed all the samples, they were in another building across the street. So when we needed things done, we would go over there and have them do the work for us. They had their own leadership. So they had their own boss, and her name was Becky. She was the head of all of soft, what we call soft goods, or sometimes we call it plush which means anything to do with fabric. So sewing and, fa and fashions, those were done by that group. And the head of the dolls group for that was Carla. And there were a number of designers that worked for her, including Carly, I think you may have all heard of Carly. And I'll say Carly Hoff, you may know her, because she, she's passed away now. But she was one of the soft goods designers. Uh, Pam, Shelly, and there, I'm sure there were more that were designers. And then in addition to the designers, there were women who were what we call sample makers. And these, and they were women, we didn't, there weren't any men sample makers, but we, these were the ones who took our designs and then sewed them up. 
So one of the things that you also need to know is that the dolls group designed the, what we call the doll in the box, which means we did the doll and the fashion that was on the doll or the fashion that came with the doll and any accessories that came in the doll, in the box with the doll. Any fashion assortments were done by the plush or the soft goods group. And there was, I, I, I'm sure that the top leadership would meet together and coordinate, but as far as I was concerned, it was like they were there and we were here and they were doing, and so because they had different management, they weren't all coming together and getting approvals. You know, they were getting approvals from their managers. And so sometimes I think there was a disconnect between what we were doing with the dolls in the box and what was going on with the fashions. And I almost they, we would present them they would all be presented when we'd have presentation days we'd all cart our stuff out for all the management to see and approve and comment on but it's it's probable that my boss Roseanne never saw the fashions before they were presented because they were approved by their boss you see so that's why I think there's sometimes a difference in the looks and the feel between the dolls in the box and the fashions so Anyway, so I walked in the door and they kind of put me in a closet, I think, my first day. And I was a little shocked. I thought I was going to have this nice office and everything, but no, I had a little closet. And um, my very first gem assignment, this is all new, you've never heard this before, was to design a gem makeup head. Uh, you know, one of the big makeup heads. Uh, <laughs> I, also need to, I also need to tell you that the toy industry is very secretive. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you should know that more than anybody. The toy we were very in fact I was just you know telling somebody a little bit earlier that this is the first time I've spoken about this to anyone. Because for all these years we could we can't talk about it. And, and um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are artists, like in the traditional way. And everything they do they put on Instagram, they put up on their website. And I'm going, no, you can't show that. <laughs> you know, there's still that mindset. So anyway, um, so nobody know. I, I just remembered that. So I did this makeup head. And of course, I, I, what that means is that I drew it, right? Because I'm a 2D. I started out as a 2D designer. So I drew it. And then my boss loved it. And it was all lovely. And so, it was, so then I did a beautiful rendering, which of course I do not have because your artwork that you do when you're working for a company belongs to the company, does not belong to you. So I can't waltz out the door with all of my artwork, although I did manage to do a few things. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't talk about it. Don't, don't uh, make that public. No, it's been 30 years, I think. So. Anyway, um, so I did this makeup head, and everybody loved it. It was a beautiful, and I, and I honestly don't remember what it looked like because it was 1986, right? So I. We have our first big, it's my first presentation in Hasbro. It, we you know, call it a line review. So you go in and you're meeting with, you're not meeting with this, the, you know, this was not with the Hassenfeld brothers, I don't think. I think this was like marketing, what they call it. So it's this, so Stephen, the head of marketing, is in this presentation. Not Stephen Hassenfeld, but another Stephen. So I walk in and we get to present our own work and so it's, you know, we're all nervous and it's really exciting so I come in with my, you know, presentation board, my lovely rendering and I stand up there in front and I start, I open my mouth to tell him what it is and he goes, next. Oh. Ah. That was the end of the gym makeup head. So sorry, we don't have that. That ended really quickly. Wow. What? No, Steve Schwartz. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, in April of 1986, um, I was asked to refresh the holograms. And frankly, I think by April of 86, you know, Toy Fair had passed, orders were coming in, and it's possible orders weren't quite what they were hoping for. I'm not really sure how. I, I can't tell you how gems sold. I don't have any of those kind of numbers. I know they were popular, but I don't, you know, it obviously didn't reach quite the threshold that they had been hoping for. So when, um, when Roseanne had asked me to do the hologram refresh, the, the one thing that she suggested that I do was try to utilize the patterns 
that were already existing. And one of the things that um, is, is really important to know, I think as consumers, as children at the time, you know, who were buying things and consumers, and now as adults looking at this line, there may be things like, oh, they used a bracelet from this doll. Why didn't they create a new bracelet? Or they, you know, they used the same, you know, shoes or the same hair picker or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's a lot of cost involved in developing toys, and even even soft goods, which you know is the, the fashions and the clothing development, creating the patterns. You know, patterns, even though they're cut out, they're die cut. You know, when they're originally cut out, and they have to make, they have to shape the shape of the patterns to cut it out. So, you know, anything that you can do to conserve cost, you'll do. And so it wasn't my necessarily my choice. I wasn't given free reign to do the holograms any way I wanted to do. She suggested, you know, and when Roseanne suggests something, you kind of do it, that I try to that I try to utilize the same patterns. But you know, one of the things as an observer, you know, coming into Gem on the second year, I was not impressed with the colors of the of the holograms and even Jem and Jerrica from the first year. I'm all about color, as you noticed from my black and white outfit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dress colorfully, but I love color. And so I wanted to make the holograms as colorful as I possibly could. And so, you know, I took the patterns, mixed them up a little bit, added a few things, but man, they were gonna get pops of color, which I think they were, we were pretty successful. Uh, in doing, and so that was the story of the holograms, and then Synergy was also uh, a little bit of kind of the same. I was given some design direction, and and maybe I don't know if I'll have time, you know, with time constraints to explain to you too much about the design process, but there's lots of different ways that you can design. You can design completely from scratch, where you have where anything goes, and you just start and you can go wherever you want to go. And there's other kinds of design where you're given restrictions, and you're told it has to have this many colors, it needs to be, you know, whatever the, whatever the parameters of the design are. And there was some guidance. And so with Synergy, it was kind of a, a combination of both. Um, one of the one of the little secrets of Synergy is that, um, and I, I left my Synergy in the other room, but there's, in her outfit, you'll notice that there's, you know, there's like a graphic, and I got the graphics kind of from Tron, remember the movie yeah. Tron, that was kind yeah. of the thing back then, and so I kind of was inspired yeah. to do the graphics, but one of the things that we did, uh, that I always did, was put like sparkles on everything, you know, so graphically. So, there are supposed to be white sparkles on that outfit, and you'll see. Oh, thank you. He's got my, he's got my, my synergy doll. And you'll have to excuse the fact that her headband is on her hair, but it's stretched out so much that I couldn't uh, put it around her forehead. But in uh, in her outfit, right here in the front, there's like a little black. Looks like a little black line that goes through the pink stripe, and there's some little black dots. Those were all supposed to be white. They were supposed to, and in fact, if you look at Sharon's artwork that was on the cover of the box, you'll see those sparkles. She did it from my original, you know, prototype, which I don't have, of course. But they were missing in production, so it was one of those things that it came. You know, we get the first shot, and I'm going, "Wait a minute, the white's missing!" And he said, "Too bad, it's too late now." So that's the thing that happens. So that's. I don't know if anybody else knows that, but you guys know that now. <laughs> Yay! Woo! Um, as far as Rhea goes, I also did the face design for Rhea. I did not design her, but I did the face. And I think that was one of my very first doll faces that I got to design and paint and create. So um, that's what happened with, um, with Rhea and with the, the other holograms. So why don't we see the next? Let's see if you can click on that.
you about my favorite gem project, and I'll just stay on the same slide. And that is our little friend, our little friend. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you the reason that it's my favorite. And, um, you know, it's been really fun coming to Gem Con. One of the things is I've, as I've been sitting and talking to different people, um, and I talk about the emotional attachment that you all have with Gem. There's something about Gem that grabbed you, either when you were a child or when you were an adult, whether it was the story of Gem, whether it was her edgy look, what, whatever it was about it, was there was an emotional tug, right? And so, um, previously, the, the things that I'd been assigned to work on were kind of assignments, you know, to refresh the holograms, to design synergy, to paint raised face. You know, they were kind of assignments. But in March, so I'd only been there for a month, um, I was given the assignment to um, create a pet. And the plan was that Jem was going to go on a world tour. And, and I think some of you may know this already, but you may not know everything about it. And I, and I don't plan to know everything about the world tour, but she was going to go on tour. That was going to be a big um, part of the 1980, uh, 1988 line. Or, let's see, this is 1987 line, I'm sorry. So, um, we, I was in charge of the pet, which means that I got to do all of the research and I got to do all of, conduct all of the brainstorms and meet with my fellow designers and we would get all of the designers, not just the, not just the doll people and we'd have a brainstorm. And so um, we talked about different places in the world that would be really interesting and what, what kind of animals would, could she pick up. And um, there was, I had been at Mattel the previous year, as I mentioned, in 1985. And even though I wasn't in the Barbie group, I was well aware of what was going on with Barbie. So, one of the things that Barbie had was a pet poodle named Prince. That's the top photo. And if any of you are familiar with Prince, how Prince was constructed was he was a skeleton, like a little internal bony skeleton that was articulated, and then plush, or the, you know, the soft goods, was sewn kind of as a sleeve and there were legs and it was articulated and it was really fun. It was kind of cool in a way, but it was also kind of creepy in a way because it was like it had little bones. So you picked up Prince and you'd feel its little legs and it was like little bones. And, but I love the fact that it was articulated and it was kind of a, you know, it was a standard size poodle. So in proportion to Barbie, it was a pretty good size. But up until that point, a fashion doll pets had been one of two things. They were either something like that or they were what we call injection molded, which is hard plastic. So these other these are other Barbie pets, dogs and things. Yeah. Those are articulated, the ones on the right are articulated, the ones on the, the one on the left is new or I think it's actually in the current line. Poops. Yeah. Um, but I'm a toy designer, right? I mean that's my world. And so for me the exploration of how I was going to create a pet was really important to me. So we talked about what different kind of pets, and I was the one that really pushed for a llama simply because of the scale. I knew it wasn't as tall as, as a gem doll, you know, so I knew it wasn't going to be like a horse that was tall, but it wasn't going to be small like a dog or a cat. And so I know we talked about gem going to Australia and maybe she would have a koala. And there was, um, there was, I believe it was a cheetah that we talked about because of this, the stripes. And I like the cheetah idea, but then again, it would just be an injection molded with some pad printing, you know, some spots on it. And I wasn't really sure. I, I liked the scale. So I kind of voted for the llama. And the thing that I have to tell you to begin with, the llama was never meant to be a premium. It was never meant to be sent in for and sent to you as in a poly bag. It was part, supposed to be part of the main line. So, um, so as I'm developing this and thinking about it, because this this is my the reason that I have the emotional tug with the llama is because I got to completely do what I wanted to do, how I wanted to create it. And so, as I'm doing my research and looking at what I want to do, our play school division had a toy that inspired me. And I want you to show the next slide. And this was snuggle bumps. <laughs> and, and I had some snuggle bumps in my office, and even though looks wise it had nothing to do with a llama, look how it was made. It was made out of rotomolded vinyl, which is the same way doll heads are made, 
which is different than injection molded, so it was soft. And then it had plush that was glued on, and how they, they did it was they created a little indentation into the vinyl, and then the, the plush was glued in there in production. And, it, and so you could brush it, it wasn't rooted like a head, it was glued in. And I wanted this to be furry, you know, not hairy, not like a My Little Pony with a tail and mane, but I wanted it to be soft. And so um, that's that was my inspiration. So snuggle bones, can you believe it? <laughs> The original name was Dalai Lama. <laughs> this is my this is my original rendering, which I still have. One of the few things I managed to spirit out of building. And originally, Dolly was supposed to come with her blanket and a beautiful little neck piece. This is called flocked rail. So this was something that could be die cut and printed on and would never ravel or didn't need to be sewn. So it was inexpensive, I mean, didn't need to be edged or hemmed, so it would be inexpensive. And then she was going to come with a, a hat box because she was going to come with a bowler hat. Because she was from Bolivia or wherever the you know, bowler was. And so uh, a hat box that would snap, go under her belly, so it would sit on top. <laughs> A feeding dish, and then of course the famous llama shaped brush, right? From the trivia question. Yeah. <laughs> and we did get the brush. So all we ended up with, of course, was the um, blanket and the brush. But that was pretty exciting. Anyway, so I was very pleased with the llama, and everybody loved the llama. But um, I was crushed when I heard it was going to be a premium because that just kind of meant nobody was going to see it. It wasn't going to be toy stores and not everybody was going to have one but I had that was not my decision to make and um, maybe some of you have seen the yellow one. <laughs> well there was scuttlebutt on the internet about the yellow llama and I'll tell you what the yellow llama was I call this my Easter llama I actually have more of these than I have of this one so um, the yellow llama was not they were never going to make a yellow llama Never. This was not going to be a yellow llama. What they do is when the manufacturer is um, working on your project, they'll send you what they call a counter sample to make sure that everything was right. And this was just so that we could check the length of the plush, we could check the construction, so we call it correct for color, I mean correct for construction, correct for quality but incorrect for color because they just put whatever they had you know on hand on here so we could just make sure that they were gluing it right and I had some comments that the you know the edges were showing and in production you don't really see the edges they do a super job but in this one I have another one that's got glue you know up on it so they had to work on it a little bit but you know we needed to, to make sure that it was right so a few of these somehow got out I've got a couple of them Few of them got out, but if you ever hear the rumor that they were going to make a yellow llama, they never were. So that's why I'm emotionally attached to the llama because she was my baby. I got to do her from beginning to end. So, um, so next slide. There she is. Oh. Page out of this notebook. I, I was telling Brian, oh, by the way, I have to give Brian Shepard lots of credit for my being here. <laughs> Brian and I have been He was contacting me in 2011 with some obscure question that I'm sure I couldn't answer. And we've been messaging back and forth for seven years, I guess, off and on. And he will send me pictures and I'll say, I have no idea what that is. I don't remember. But he caused me to go back and, you know, try to remember things because as a new, I was still a pretty new designer when I came to Hasbro and in, in 1986 I didn't keep a, a daily calendar. I just didn't do it. I, I had notebooks, you know, that I took notes in meetings and things. And, um, and in 1987, that's when I first started keeping a, a daily planner. And so, every, you know, for 87, everything I worked on, every little deadline is written down but I didn't have that. So I, I found my old notebooks and I went back and I found this page 
dated October 21st, 1986. And this is a group meeting, and this is my assignments. So you all have to know that I was working on other dolls besides Jen. And so the first thing is Moon Dreamer. This is, this is open, yeah. right? <laughs> open stock. That means the new Moon Dreamer dolls. And, and I, I, if I have time, we can talk about other, th that kind of thing. But I'm going to try to run through. And then you go down further, and it says Jem Jerrica Redo. Well, it took me a long time to figure out. But what that was was the 1988, because we were already, this was the 87 line was already put to bed because this is fall, so it's already put to bed. It's being shown at Toy Fair, right, in, in uh, a few months, right? But it's already done. So this is for 88. So th that means that the, gem, the um, Flash and Sizzle, or, or the Gem Jerrica for 1988 was going to be done by me, okay? And then there was, it says Gem Wedding, Kimber and Male. Um, okay, the, there's dates out of there. It says plush one two. That means that the design, the the actual fabric sample would be due on the in January. And then PTO, that means preliminary turnover, and that was going to happen in March. And I will tell you now, I am not here to solve the mystery of the Kimber wedding. Because I don't have any further records of that. Um, uh, by that point, it must have been put on hold because, in, you know, a few months later when I started putting my calendar together, I don't have any notes at all on the Kimber wedding. But it was assigned to me, so you can blame me if there's no if there's no records of it. You can speculate as to what it was, but there was going to be a Kimber wedding doll and a and a male groom. But I, that's pretty much all I remember. Wow. <laughs> so there was going to be a groom. Okay, so, um, in, Jan in January, January 15th, 1987, the entire design group moved into that, remember the two pictures I showed you of Hasbro, you know there was the taller building? They completely remodeled the entire north end of that building for design. It was the most awesome design center. They still use it today and that was the design center. There were offices on the south end of the building that were other corporate, other departments. But the design had the entire north wing, and an artists like North Light. So they had it was an old factory building, and there were beautiful large windows. You can actually go on Google Earth and kind of drive around and see these big windows. Um, but we had they, so they they opened. They've been planning this and working on it for about a year, and so they finally moved us in in January middle of January of 1987. About a week after I uh, moved into my new, my new office, and I had a window office because I was a senior designer. Show the next slide. I took some Polaroids. I'm sorry, it's not really great Polaroids because I'm not going to go, I mean, I'm not going to go through uh, fat or slowly, but you know, my office, we'll go to the next one. It, there's my drawing table, and there's that big window, and actually it's much taller than that. That's just the lower half of the window. I'll go to the next one. But the office was was pretty clean. I don't have a lot on my on my office. Next slide. Okay, so then um, I'm looking at this picture, and I'm looking at this picture. Next. I'm going, what the heck is that? And I re all of a sudden, I remembered what that was. That was the 1988 Jerrica doll. Oh. That is, and, you, and you, you'll get to see another version in a minute. And I remembered that doll. She had a green dress with dolman sleeves. It was a wrap dress, and she was covered with bright colored stars. I tell you, I'm all about the color, right? And I remembered that the sample was made for me, and I remembered cutting out the stars and gluing them, you know, out of fabric and gluing them on her dress. And she had a jaunty reddish orange beret, you know, like Jericho would wear, and bright yellow stockings. She's not wearing shoes in this picture. And and then it kind of came back to me. And then and then I went back to that. <coughs> next. I went back to this picture, and then next. And then I went, oh my gosh, what the heck, there must be jam. Oh, wow. So this was, remember I was assigned, I told you back in October, I was assigned to do the Gem Jerrica refresh. 
So that is, that is Jim. So then I had to, you know, by this point, this is very recent, and then I thought, this is kind of the missing link, you know, as far as my, my development of my assignments for, for Jim in 19, for 1988. So, um, because I was the designer, I started putting things together and I thought, oh my gosh, that was for 1988. This is 2018. This is 30 years ago. Isn't that so cool? So, I decided that my contribution to Gem Con would be next. I would do a sketch oh of my God. Silver. She had a big silver bow in her waist and kind of a what is that style with the wrap? It's kind of a off the shoulder a wrap top. I know there's a name, but I'm not a fashion designer. So anyway, in honor of the, the 30th anniversary of what would have been the 1988 line, I'm going to um, present these drawings for you. So um, I'm going to tell you. Um, I already told you a little bit about the structure and who was designing what. Um, I have to say that Roseanne, our boss, Jem was Roseanne's baby. And um, let's see. Why don't you go to the next slide? This is Kathy's. Well, I put her name on, of course, and I wasn't good, but her last name has changed, so that was her main name. Kathy was, she really did. She, uh, a lion's share of the 1980, uh, I, I imagine 1986 line, I wasn't there yet, but the 1987 line. She did um, the Misfits, she did the Starlight Girls, she did pretty much everything. Um, Roseanne, our boss, did Jim. And when I look at Glitter and Gold Jim, I see Roseanne's face. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that was her baby. She championed Jim and did the gem, the gem dolls, and, and I wish I could remember exactly who did which, but Kathy was um, a primary mover, and, and she's currently at um, Spin Master Toys as a vice president of design there. And um, we had, in, in our other designer, as I said, didn't, didn't do dolls, I mean, didn't do the work on the gem line, she was working on Moon Dreamers and some other lines. Um, but our, the soft goods group, I, I had been really good friends with one of the soft goods designers, and you can uh, you can show, see her name. Her name was Pam, and Pam was not in the dolls group at, at this time in 1987. She joined the group. I mean, she joined the group in '87, but she did not work on the. She probably worked on the fashions, and I couldn't tell you what she did. But she became part of the dolls group later, and so we worked closely together on Maxi and, and other lines. But I just had those because they were just small pictures that I had, so I just had to bring them, right? I'll show you. Um, let's see. In uh, sometime in 1987, I think about May of 1987, the soft goods group was disbanded, and that's when uh, Carly left the company, and when Shelly and Pam joined our group, and um, I don't. The other women who were doing sewing, they stayed as sample anchors, but they weren't, uh, they didn't have the same structure anymore, so things kind of changed. So, um, next slide. So at the same time that I was working on Maxi, I was working on all of these other lines too. Moon Dreamers, which was kind of the doll line of my heart, um, which is at the bottom right, I did most of the 1987 line of Moon Dreamers, which were shown at Toy Fair but never released, really, so that's another tragedy. So they're in the catalog. Uh, Sweetie Pops, which was originally called Sweet Stuff, which was a little preschool doll that, don't even get me started. Uh, <laughs> Real Baby, which I worked on for about my first, I don't know, most of a year, but I just worked on a toddler doll that never ended up being released, um, and I have opinions on that, and I won't 
I'm sure you know. <laughs> and a little doll line called Love a Bye Baby, which was originally called Itty Bitty Baby. We, um, you know that dolls a lot of times have a working title, a working name before names are approved. You all know the original name of Jim, right? Yeah. yeah. What is it? Yeah. And do you know why it was changed? You can't have to write a letter. Right, can't have to write a letter. So that's why you still see him on a lot of the tooling and stuff. Because it's, speaking of tooling, um, you, I, you sent me, Brian sent me a picture of the, was it a boat? Uh, the plane. The plane, the plane. Was there a plane? Oh, did it actually come out? No. No. Okay. See, I, I, don't, I didn't even keep track of the process. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, but tooling, what they call tooling, is your, most, is your single most expensive feature of toys because it involves making molds. Molds can cost tens of thousands of dollars, especially, especially for a playset. You can't very easily change a mold and take that M off it and, you know, you might be able to scrape it out or sand it down or something like that, but it's really expensive. So you have to be really careful how you use your budget for your tooling. So playsets, generally speaking, uh, the first year a toy is released, the playsets will be small and simple. And then depending on how successful it is, then you'll move to your planes and your ships and yachts and you know your your RVs and things. But your first year you might do just a little a little studio or a little vanity or something like that. Because the tooling is so expensive. So, you know, these all things cost a lot of money and it takes a long time to develop a, a you know, molds, those take, they can take months to create molds. So the process for developing toys is extremely long. Soft goods or plush is, is a shorter turnaround. So you can create a fashion for a doll in a very short amount of time. But that I mean months, I don't mean weeks, months. But a doll, anything that requires molding, uh, and even if you have, if you, even if you've already got the mold, the, the actual casting process takes a lot of time. Decorating it, you know, doing everything, sending it back and forth. You have to test everything to make sure it's safe. You have to make sure it's reliable, that it's not flammable. You have to test, the, you know, the packaging has to be, be developed. I mean, generally speaking, your average toy probably is about a year in development. And it can be longer depending on the tool, the molding and things. And so, you know, we have to consider all of these things. And so even a toy, would come out, it's been in development for a year, so the cartoon has to be much further behind. Um, so they kind of can come out at the same time or certain things can come out. But because I'm not involved in the cartoon, I can't exactly speak to that. Um, but one of the things uh, that I learned very early in my career was to not fall in love with your product. And you guys have all fallen in love with Jem because of that emotional attachment that I was talking about. And having an emotional attachment as a designer can really have its downfalls. I'm gonna tell you a real quick story. The, my first year in toys, as I mentioned, I was at Mattel, and I was in the large and small girl, dolls group, and one of the products that we developed was Popples. I think you all know Popples. I was part of the Popples team. And one of the tasks that I was assigned to do was to create a Popples playset. We had a little, there were some, Little popples. Do you remember those? They had little yep. plastic feet and yep. features. I designed those. Thank you. And <laughs> all the big popples. I designed. Anyway, it was a team effort. There was no one person that did popples. We there were probably four or five of us that worked together, and we all had our part. I did the eyes. I did the you know the colors because you know I'm all about color. And I did these little popples. So one of the things that I was asked to do was to design a playset for the little popples. And I had this fabulous idea. Oh my gosh, it was so fabulous. I wanted to do one of those cute, like alarm clocks, you know, the old fashioned analog alarm clock that has the little bells on the top. And have you ever seen ones that are clear so you can see the gears and everything? And I thought, oh my gosh, that would be so cute to have these colorful popples who live in this alarm clock and they sit on the gears and they go around on the hand and all this and so. I'm, you know, I'm just so into this, and I'm drawing this, and I'm doing renderings, and my boss comes around, and she says, Stephanie, I just really don't think that's working. And I said, oh, Carla, another Carla. I was like, oh, Carla, this is, you know, but it's such a cute idea. Just, just let me, you know, finesse it a little bit more. So, okay, I said, I'll let you. So I, 
I worked on it a little bit more and I you know, created some more views and different things and she came by again and she said, no, it's just not working. And I was just crushed. Oh my gosh, I thought it was such a good idea. And I thought she was totally wrong and that it would have been so cute and worked really well. Well, it doesn't matter if she was right or wrong. She was the boss and she said no. And that's how it is, you know, in the business. You can have the best idea in the world, and if your upper management or your manager or your boss says, that ain't happening, it ain't happening. And so I learned from that not to fall in love with my own designs, because I'd kind of fallen in love with this, whole, and I really wanted to push it. Sometimes you push, you know, you push back a little bit, you don't just say, you know, okay, whatever, you have your own ideas, but that's kind of the realities of the design business is that we often have disappointments. And so as a designer, I learned really early on to not get too attached to my designs and to let it go. And when poor little Dolly was um, kind of deep six to the premium area and not to the store shelves, I just, you know, you move on. But anyway, the whole point of this is that I was working on lots and lots of other products, and so Jim was just one of many things that I was working on. Um, in 1987, in addition to a few cleanup projects, really, I began working on a doll called Cindy. And those of you who know, know where this is going, Cindy was a property of Pedigree Toys in England, and probably their most successful doll rival to Barbie, and the Cindy doll, spelled with an S. And um, we had gained the, I guess, the U.S. rights. And honestly, it's been so long ago, I don't remember all the machinations of how this whole thing went. But it, by February of 1987, and this is while we were still working on Jam, we got the rights to start working on Cindy. And we decided that the original Cindy molds were not appropriate for an American audience, that they were used to more of the Barbie kind of a look. And so we began working on um, creating a more wholesome kind of, not gem. We were not, this Maxi, and of course Cindy became Maxi because Pedigree was not happy with the direction we were taking Cindy. They thought it was too Barbie looking and they didn't, so they distanced themselves. And I, like I said, I don't, I can't tell you any legal or, you know, um, technical aspects of how that whole thing went. I was just a designer. But by May, she was known as Maxi. So I just know like February, March, I started working on what was then Cindy and then by May. So it was never to be a replacement. We, there was never any um, discrepancy between the size of Jim and the size of Maxi. Maxi was meant to be more Barbie size. I think by 1987 though, we realized that the, what, we, what we thought the unique size of, of, Mac, of Jim was was a plus ended up being a negative. And there's always, I know that there's a, has always been a lot of discussion about why Jem was as tall as she was. Well, you have to understand too that other than, Bar other than Barbie, fashion dolls were all over the place in size. You know, the 11 and a half inch fashion doll was not necessarily the only size that dolls were made back then. You know, there were lots of fashion dolls. There were many fashion dolls. There were, you know, there were 18-inch fashion dolls, there were 14-inch fashion dolls. So, you know, that, that whole Barbie standard, I guess, was happening, but, but Roseanne didn't want to be constrained by Barbie proportions and Barbie size and by fitting into Barbie clothes. That was never the intention. Jem was always meant to be unique and stand alone and be a statement, right? You guys know that. She, yeah. was, a, she was definitely a statement. But by 1987, I think it became really obvious that what we thought was a statement was ending up being a negative because parents were complaining to us all the time that their kids were so frustrated because she couldn't wear Barbie clothes. We didn't care that she couldn't wear Barbie clothes. But, you know, there are... <laughs> but, you know, we have to be responsive to our consumers, right? Because they're the ones who are buying the dolls and you guys may see it that way, but a lot of these parents were objecting and there were problems. I mean, we never intended, there was never a thought of downsizing Jem. Never. That never happened. But, um, but even if we had, we would never have made her feet look like Barbie feet. Just so you know. <laughs> um, so, next. The year 
of 1987, which is when um, Jim made her unfortunate demise, I, was, I began working on other doll lines at Hasbro. Um, my beautiful doll, which was codenamed Cody with a K, which was actually a Marlene Dancer doll that was, she, she did the original Kimberly doll, for those of you who know Kimberly doll, uh, which was a tall, she was another doll that was kind of tall. I mean, she was about like yay, yay tall. 15, 7, 6, she wasn't 18 inches, but 16 or 17 inches, I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, I worked on, of course, Maxi. You see Maxi. I did, on Maxi, I did many assortments. I did um, Slumber Party, I did all the beach ones, I did some of the fancy dress ones. I mean, I, we were a team. There were probably three of us that worked on Maxi. And I, probably did, you know, a third of the of the dolls. So mm -hmm. I worked heavily on Maxi. And then Dolly Surprise came in. Woo! And Dolly Surprise, thank you. <laughs> uh, I did not work on the first year of Dolly Surprise. That was in the Play School division. Play School and Hasbro were the same company, part of the same company. Play School was down the hall, right? So the, the team that did the first year kind of designed it down the hall. And then because I was, you know, kind of became the cute doll queen, they invited me to take over. So I did a huge portion of Dolly Surprise for 1987 and 1988, to the point where in 1989 I was transferred to the play school division and I did all the play school dolls. So that was kind of what happened um, as far as, you know, my career at Hasbro. In 1990, beginning of 1990, next slide, I left Hasbro and went to Tonka, where I designed the Cupcakes dolls. <laughs> Again, second year, the first year it was already designed, and I thought, oh my gosh, I could make these so much cuter. <laughs> <laughs> so all of the Princess Parfait, Tropical Treats, the um, originally, well, let's see, they were called the Cotton Candy. They originally they were whipped cream. <laughs> Um, anyway, I designed, and then surprisingly, I designed the WWF Wrestling Buddies, which is the most successful toy line I've ever designed. And uh, that's, that's a whole story. I wrote about it on my blog once. If anybody's interested, I'll hook you up with that, that story about how that whole thing came to be. But let me tell you, those wrestling buddy collectors are pretty much like you guys. They are nuts, and they write to me, and, want me, and I've got prototypes. Of and because Tonka, I was only there for two years because Tonka was bought by Hasbro. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I did not, as much as I loved, I really loved Hasbro. As much as I loved Hasbro, I didn't want to go back. And I was pregnant. And uh, so I went down to Kenner and inter interviewed at Kenner because they also bought Kenner, but I was like out to here. And um, I decided to stay on my own. And so after Tonka closed its doors, I uh, freelanced for about six months with a brand new baby. And I, while I was doing that, I started inventing. And I invented a doll, which is on the bottom right, called Cuddle by Baby, which was inspired by my newborn baby. And that's another story. And that concept was sold to Fisher Price. And so Fisher Price then hired me, so I went to work for Fisher Price in 1992 and was there for three years until Mattel bought Fisher Price. <laughs> and, then, and then I was transferred back to Mattel. And I will tell you, and this is fine, it's on the record, I never liked working for Mattel. I, I loved my coworkers, I loved the products that I worked on, but I did not love the culture. Of Mattel, and, and that's fine. You know, not every com not every culture works for every person, and every company has a culture. And and Mattel's culture was very Barbie centric, and I was not a fashion designer. I was not a Barbie designer. You know, speaking of fashion design, if you're a Barbie designer, you almost can't go anywhere else to get a job because it's so specialized at Mattel. But if you're a good toy designer, you can go anywhere because. You've got skills, you know, I'm a doll designer, I'm a toy designer, I, can, I have lots of different skills that I can apply to different companies. But, but some companies like Mattel are so big and people are, you know, you have people there that all they do is root hair. All they do is paint faces. All, and, you know, I have to do all that stuff, you know. I've had learned how to do all those things and so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my career. So, next slide. 
And then these are some of the later things that I designed. After I, after I left Mattel in 1997, I had my own business for 12 years. And I worked for everybody. I worked, did a lot of work for Mattel, including Barbie, but it was more like Barbie accessories. Worked for Hasbro, Playmates, uh, Spin Master. I've got my list of all the toys. I did this for 12 years. And then in 19, uh, or, I mean, sorry, 2009, I went to uh, Spin Master. And I was there for, actually, yeah, these things on the bottom were done for um, uh, Live. You guys know Live Fashion yeah, Palace? Yeah. So I worked on the Live and Victorious lines at Spin Master. And then, surprisingly, I got laid off. And so then, um, in the summer of 2012, I went to work for Toys R Us and moved to New Jersey, moved from California to New Jersey. By this point, our kids were grown, and so my husband and I just and rented a little one-bedroom apartment in New Jersey, and I went to work for Toys R Us, and was the manager of the girls group there, and did the um, that really fun dollhouse, which is a toy of my heart, because I got to do everything in it. And then this uh, cute little um, wooden, this is a wooden tree house that's about yay high, and it's, I did everything with that. I did those at Toys R Us. And then in the summer of 2015, I was recruited away by Madame Alexander in New York. So I went to work for Madame Alexander as the director of the Play Doll Division. And I lasted there 10 months, and they let me go for unknown reasons. So then I was kind of stuck um, living in New Jersey and unemployed. <laughs> And I thought that wouldn't be a good idea. But the plan was to work for myself again. And so, you know, kind of things happened and we ended up moving to Utah and moved into my brother's house. He was out of the country. He offered us his house rent free for a while till we could kind of figure out what we were going to do. And then a year later, we found a nice townhouse and I'm just living there doing art and freelancing. And that's kind of catching me up with me. So that is, I think that's the last slide. And look it, it's 10, 12. I have time for three minutes of questions. <laughs> I was planning on like 20 minutes for question and answer, but then somebody else said to me, I'll just talk and so, okay, yeah, you and the cute one. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, Synergy Doll? About what? The Synergy Doll. Uh -huh. You started talking about um, how when you do designs, there's like certain limitations that are put on things mm -hmm. or different directions. That, that's one of the things that people talk about, her being so different from the look of the cartoon. Did they tell you, like, these are the colors we want to use? Who's they? Whoever was in charge oh. of. Uh, yes, and I, I wish, because this was an assignment where I didn't have, I didn't come up with the backstory. You know, with the llama, for example, we decided that, you know, Jen, if Jen was going to go on tour, where was she going to go and what was she going to do? This was kind of assigned to me, and I, the parameters were pretty much already established. I did the, you know, physical, figured out what it was going to look like. Some of it had been kind of handed to me. I, I wish I could tell you. Um, and as far as the cartoon, I mean, the cartoon came after, right? So I can't tell you why it looked so different in the cartoon. Um, the I, cartoon, um, Synergy was in, right. in the beginning, so it had a look, and then the doll came out with a different look. But, but again, the, I don't know how that worked out time-wise when, because Synergy was in development for a long time in-house in at Hasbro, it could have been already in development when the car cartoon came out, even though she didn't come out until Christmas time of, of 1980, when was that been, 1987, so I, I can't well, I that. Art of to work with when I was, was it this art? Okay, so I... Because you have to do something much more limited animation. Right. what we're doing, it had to be a lot synonymous. Right. You know, a lot, a lot more taste in that. Yeah, of course. Think about animating a figure and how yeah. complicated that would be. All these details and sparkles and, you know, it's like, really? Nowadays, you could probably be much easier with the, uh, you know, computer-aided... But the, back then, everything's hand drawn. I can imagine you've got to keep it simple. But I really, I really can't speak for any differences between 
product and the cartoon because I wasn't involved in the cartoon development. And I'm sure my boss was, but she never passed out on me, so I apologize. Any other? Yes, I dare. Hi. Did you have anything to do with anything from the stingers? Um, anything <laughs> <laughs> anything? No. Yeah. I would say I would say Kathy um, worked on stingers. I'm sure she did. And if you guys could persuade her, you'd probably never have me back because she would probably. That's not the truth. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, I, I thought the stingers were awesome. You know, we really fell in love with the whole idea and the colors. I mean, you know, the yellow, black. I mean, the, I love the drama of the stingers. So, you know, I, I was there at the presentations, and Kathy, who, who did them, sat right across from me, you know, in our offices. But honestly, you know, you're doing your work and you're not paying attention to what everybody's doing. You see the presentation, and then, but you're also presenting Moon Dreamers, and you're presenting, you know, all of these things, and you, you're doing so much, you just don't have time to just sit there and go, oh my gosh, that is so awesome. So I apologize that I don't know more about stingers. Yes? Were you kept in the loop at all as far as when the jump line would be discontinued? Were you guys notified yeah. at all? We, we were, and but I didn't write it down. I could just kick myself, because I wrote down the day that Moon Dreamers died. I wrote it with a sad face and with tears and everything, and, and that really broke my heart because I, I'm cute. I mean, what can I say? I do cute more than I do like edgy. I'm just the just me. So, they tell you sales. Honestly, it's sales. It's it has nothing to do with the quality of the design because the fans love Jim. The fans love Moon Dreamers, but it's all about the money. And you know, you've got the bottom line people who are saying sales did not meet expectations, and we're going to deep six this this project and sometimes literally when I worked at um, Mattel oh I did fail to mention when I went back to Mattel I worked on I was at also in large and small dolls and I worked on Cabbage Patch Kids oh, okay. and you might remember there was a doll called Snack Time Kids that oh, yeah. ate hair you yeah. heard about that yeah, yeah. it's actually not really true they I think they were kind of hoaxes but the company didn't want to take any chances and so rumor was, and again, I have to say rumor because if I say definitively, then you'll go out and tell your friends, but they had <laughs> produced all these snack time kids. The snack time kid was a, she had a little backpack, and in the backpack was food, like a little french fry, little cookies and little things, and she had a mechanism, and when you put it up to her mouth, it would trigger the mechanism, and she'd chew, 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 and it would suck the food into her mouth, and then it would go through her body into the backpack. Then you could pull it out and feed it to her. Well, apparently this mechanism was grabbing little girl's hair. Although I had a, I had a fellow designer who had really long hair. She kept feeding it to different ones and it never ate her or it didn't hurt her. You know, I mean, it might have eaten and then it stopped. But anyway, so what I understand they did was there was, they, they ship toys. They come on a ship. They don't fly them. They're, they're not sent air mail. They're, they're produced in China. They had this big ship, uh, you know, that was crossing the Pacific Ocean from China to get to California. And my understanding is they just took that carton and just dumped it in the ocean. Oh my God! That's what I heard. I just I can't swear to it. When I say deep six, I literally. <laughs> Yes, yeah, and if you guys have, have you guys been watching yes. the toys that made us from yes. Yes. She was about it. She was well, that was Judy Shackelford, who happens to be a friend of mine, so, I, and I think very highly of her, but that's true. And, and Mattel, now this is back in the day, so I don't, I can't say specifically if that's the case now, but how it was is Mattel had their own manufacturing plants in China, whereas everybody else used all the same manufacturing plants. So there's like, you know, maybe a dozen big manufacturing plants, and you, one of them specializes in plush, so you go there if you're having a stuffed animal made, and one, spe, you know, others specialize in dolls, and, and so you have these companies, so you start seeing the same, no matter what toy company you work for, you start seeing the same manufacturers coming up. And it was funny because somebody had mentioned Jetta was the name of one of those, and there was a doll uh, in the Gemline Jetta. Um, and, and that's true. We, Jetta was one of the factories that we used. And so apparently Mattel would send their 
spies out to the different manufacturers, because they have their own manufacturing plants. And I think even in the 80s, back when Jem was being done, who saw, and so we did, Jem did come first, that, that's true. Jem came first and Mattel <coughs> stole it. And they were able, because they already had all of these molds for guitars and drums and things already in their stock, they were able to whip the rockers out like speedy. You know, they had their they had their dedicated plant. See, if you were another company, you couldn't do that because then you'd have to shop around for a manufacturer. You'd have to find somebody, make all the deals. They already had that in. They were able to just sneak that doll line in there, and you know, I don't know time frame exactly who came out. Did they come out first, or did they? You know, yeah. it was a wash, right? I mean, they came out around the same time, but no, Jem was first. There's no doubt. Yeah. My question is, there is the reason the series was discontinued is because the money for the dolls would also not produce money to continue the animation for the series, or was the money for both separate? Separate. Yeah. The the um, I'm sure that the animated series would not find it financially viable to continue if they didn't have the advertising dollars for the toys. So they, yeah, one was dependent on the other, but they were still independent, you know, if you know what I mean. They could have continued, but why would they do that? Because, again, you're relying on, on Hasbro's advertising dollars to support your development, and if Hasbro's pulled the line, they're not going to be giving you, they may be advertising Transformers, but that's not going to help you, you know, with your show. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, you first thing. Um, so, all right, I hope you didn't talk about this because I've been popping in and out. Did you do anything with Clash? No. Okay. I didn't. Because <laughs> she did come out second year, so I'm like, I don't know where the point is. You know, I'm going to be here all weekend. If you, I have a booth over. I'm going to be selling okay. my limited edition prints and buttons and things that are just, I just created them for Gen Con. And exclusive. Um, anyway, you can stop by and ask me questions, and I probably can't answer them, but I will try. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, this isn't gem related, but you Wait. mentioned you work for Taka. I did. And I wondered if you worked on the Star Fairies at all. Um, maybe. <laughs> okay, that's my favorite line. I, I was gone, I, I mean, tail end of the Star Fairies. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, oh, okay. wait, we have a question here with Walter. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, can you quickly mention about you getting the, the message that Jem was canceled and that Jem then was uh, being going to be revived? Well, I got, and I was going back through my, I got, or, I'm, and I didn't write everything down. You know, if I did, I don't have that anymore. But in my notes, so we're talking about late spring of 87, we were told that Jim was on hold. So being on hold just means we're stopping our development on it, and then decisions are going to be made. And then I have a note in my July 87 calendar at the very top that says, Jim lives. So what I'm guessing happened was that they came in a presentation and they said, we're taking it off hold. And then probably, so it would have been after that. So sometime after July of 87, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I'll, I'll look. Maybe they're in here somewhere. I just couldn't see them. The line was killed. So it would have been um, summer or fall of 87. So I don't have the exact date. So yes. Okay, looking at your designs for Gem and Jerrica for uh -huh. the 88, did you do anything with the pizzazz doll? That's a really good question, and I was gonna and I was gonna tell you that I don't know. Um, I my guess is what happened was I presented those dolls because they were sewn up, right? But I also have the dates that they were supposed to be, the soft goods were supposed to be done and they were supposed to be turned over, and those don't match anything in my calendar. So my guess is that um, they were just kind of, we presented them, they were accepted, and then we didn't do anything with them, and then the line went away. So um, I don't have any technical details about the dresses, and I honestly had forgotten about them until I looked at those pictures, so. Thank you, Brian, for making me look at those pictures <laughs> again.
did you have know about or have any contact with the original designer of the concept, Bill Sanders and the other two people? No, I didn't. Um, and, and I don't know how involved he, they were as far as approvals and things afterwards uh, because I I didn't come in until I came in right after Toy Fair '86. So I came in after the first line had been presented and then while I was in production. So, so. They, so they didn't have any. I don't think so. And knowing Roseanne, she probably said, this is what it's going to be. <laughs> okay, I wish I could answer more questions. I, we have a new presenter. Can you go so. through the panel tomorrow morning with all the guests? So there's time for more questions then. We're going to do a five minute break before Christy starts. And just